Even as nation states observe lockdown and regionalization is the new mantra, it is imperative for us to continue to allow for a free flow of knowledge and scientific information across the world. It's really with this intent that JLF's Brave New World was created. On behalf of Namita Gokhale and William Dalrymple and all my colleagues, It is imperative in many ways for us to continue this conversation. For those of you who have missed out on our earlier sessions, including the outstanding Margaret Atwood, Pete Choir, Scott Pritchie, Tina Brown, Peter Carey, Chumpa Lahiri, James Allison, Shubha Mudgal, Peter Morgan, Ritesh Patra, Kiran Mazumdar Shah, Roger Highfield, Ajit Salwani, Tim Krishna, and so many others. You can catch them on our Facebook page, JLF Fest, and on our YouTube channel, Jaipur Fest. Tell you more about our stellar lineup. Please welcome festival directors, Rokhle and William Chandra. absolutely delighted by the enthusiastic response from around the world to our stellar new series J Hi there we've put together an incredible literary festival for you online JLF Brave New World all the writers we love most at Jaipur Peter Frankopan Jhumpa Lahiri Margaret Around Atwood have been joined right by now? a whole galaxy of stars I am indeed no secrets to the festival. we can talk about like it Peter <laughs> Carey uh, Evan Duval Alain de Botton it's an incredible lineup. Um, Ohan Pamuk Neil Gaiman I mean really it just goes on and on and on come and join us Brave New World every Wednesday Saturday and Sunday evening on a phone or laptop near you Thank you Namita thank you William our official radio partner is Red FM Bajate Rahul our first session today on JLF's brave new world is aftershocks what awaits us in the post pandemic world a crucial session on the unpredictable scenario after the peak virus stage for our khana tells us of global economic fragmentation red zone geographies and how regionalization may be the new globalization Parakh Khanna is a leading global strategy advisor, world traveler and best-selling author. He is the founder and managing partner of Future Map, a data and scenario-based strategic advisory firm. Parakh's newest book is The Future in Asian Commerce, Conflict and Culture in the 21st Century. He is the author of a trilogy of books on the future of the world order, beginning with The Second World, Empires and Influence in the New Global Order, followed by how to run the world charting a course to the new and the next sorry the next renaissance and concluding with a connectography mapping the future of global civilization parag has also been an advisor to the us national intelligence council's global trends 2030 program in addition to his columns as a cnn global contributor khanna's articles have appeared in major international publications including the wall street journal Financial Times, Washington Post, Harvard Business Review, Times, and The Atlantic. Speaking with him today is Suhasini Haider. Over the course of a 22-year-old career in journalism, Suhasini has covered the most challenging stories and conflicts from the subcontinent and beyond, including Pakistan, Sri Lanka, Libya, Lebanon, and Syria. Suhasini was also the foreign affairs editor and primetime anchor at CNN, IBM. from 2005 to 2014 where she presented the signature show world view with suhasini haider and was correspondent at cnn international new delhi bureau her articles at the hindu have covered a wide range of topics including indian foreign policy 
international diplomacy, and global security challenges. She has won the Prem Bhatia Memorial Award for the best political reporting in 2015. She's presently the diplomatic and national editor at The Hindu. Ladies and gentlemen, please remember to ask comments, to comment and ask questions by typing it in the comment section below. Do also follow our handles, JLF Litfest on Facebook, Twitter and Instagram to get notified on the upcoming sessions. In case any of you drop off due to bandwidth issues, you can find us on our YouTube channel, Jaipur Litfest JLF. Ladies and gentlemen, aftershocks, what awaits us in the post-pandemic world? Parag Khanna in conversation with Suhasini Haider. Thanks a lot, Sanjay, and thanks so much for joining us tonight, Parag. It's, of course, uh, late at night there in Singapore. We're just a bit behind you. Um, and uh, metaphorically, too, you've been a bit ahead of the rest of the world on so many of the predictions you've made as a future risk analyst, as a futurist. Um, so I do have to start by asking you, um, as we sit over here and we're talking about future shocks, which almost completely presupposes that the world after coronavirus is going to be so much more scary uh, than the world before it. How much of this had you really thought was going to happen? Uh, particularly, how much of the after effects have you been talking about? Great to chat with you, Sasini. Thank you so much for having me. And I'm just uh, thrilled to be part of the series that the JLF has put together. It's so incredibly well curated and I'm sort of, you know, glued to watching these different conversations. This is, as you know, and you've written as well, is the first most widely covered event in human history. Quite frankly, it's the single, it's the first time in all of human history that you can genuinely say that mankind has coordinated a single act, which is to say more or less to lockdown. And a part of that includes obviously the total freeze on global migration, right? No one is crossing borders right now. So sitting at home is actually a fascinating you know, time in which to reflect on what might come next. And there are certain things that as I was sitting and thinking about it, that are really going to accelerate trends that were underway prior to the pandemic. So it wasn't all that difficult, despite all the uncertainty that we do, you know, we have to obviously with uh, have a great deal of humility in terms of what's going to happen in the future. But we do know that shocks have aftershocks, earthquakes have aftershocks, it goes without saying. So what are the next ones? Um, now, there's a couple of things. The first is the trends that were already underway that will accelerate. And these are what you would call secular trends. They are these irrevocable, almost, processes and, uh, and, and the, uh, the, the trends around the pandemic will simply uh, uh, elevate them. One is this regionalism, right? Regionalization is the new globalization. And we've almost chosen that as our point of departure. It's almost hard to disagree at this point. The evidence is so incredibly overwhelming. Just think about the US-China trade war and that decoupling. The US trades much more with Canada than it does with China. The US trades much more with Mexico than it does with China. China, for its part, trades more with Southeast Asia than it does with the United States. And Europe, of course, has 70% of its trade internal. So there's absolutely no question that we live in a world that is more regional than it is global. There is a North American system. It has its own logic, its own driving forces, its own obviously cultural variables and, and parameters. Same thing for Europe. And Asia being, of course, the largest region by far, the most people by far, the largest number of civilizations by far, has its own internal dynamics. And that is where the world already was going. And with everyone pulling back, drawing back into their shells, so to speak, and obviously our inability to even conceive of transcontinental travel anytime soon, we're going to have a hard time one region really shaping the other decisively. Rather, each region is going to shape itself. So that's an example of one of these things you can simply just predict with great confidence is going to be the same moving forward. We can talk about lots of the aftershocks, obviously. Some of the ones, as you know, relate to countries that you and I have both uh, traveled in, studied, written about the countries of the Near East, the, the countries really in the underbelly of Eurasia, uh, the, um, the, the North African countries, the Petro states. These places are in for a very, very, very rough ride. Now, again, just to just a quick point, that began in 2014, right? Oil prices began to crash in 2014. They've ab utterly cratered now. How can one possibly craft a rosy scenario for those countries? So it's not a difficult prediction to make. 
that negative oil prices are going to create uh, you know significant aftershocks for those economies and societies as well. Uh, you know, you said regionalization is the is the new globalization. But do you really think globalization can go away? I mean, I know you've written about the butterfly effect, and and the truth is that regardless of how uh, the coronavirus actually uh, reached man, whether it was from a lo laboratory or whether it was a wet market or everything in between, uh, the fact is that small whatever incident in Wuhan has now ensured that people across the world cannot leave their homes. Um, people have changed the way they work. People have changed the way they look at their futures and uh, or concerns about their health and all the rest of that. So do you really think globalization is going away and it'll give a uh, uh, way to these small worlds instead? No, 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 not at all. And, you know, I think the critical thing, and I'm glad you raised the question, is that we balance both these ideas at the same time. You know, by volume or density of interactions, whether it's human migration, whether it's trade in goods and other factors, regionalism is voluminously more significant at the moment than those transcontinental forces. Even if you never had a pandemic, let's remember that even global energy markets, which are a very important barometer of globalization, have been receding. We don't really need to send oil tankers all over the world anyway, because so many regions are moving towards alternative and renewable energy sources. China has taken a big lead in that. India is pushing in that direction. Europe has grid parity. North America is itself already now the largest oil and gas producer, doesn't need to import anything. So we were deglobalizing in certain critical areas of the world economy. That doesn't mean that we don't have this global connectivity. And I champion that connectivity probably as much as anyone you know, alive. Uh, you know, so I still believe it's there. Globalization is the extent to which you use that connectivity at any given time. We have airports, we have airlines, no one's using them right now. Do we have universal aviation connectivity? Absolutely. Are we using it? Zilch, right? So globalization is just a, a very constantly fluctuating set of metrics. That's all. Okay, so the so much operates through connectivity. Sure. Sorry, I, I, I cut you short there, but I was saying it's about how much you will use it. Um, you've spoken about the fact that there's already a trend, and in fact, that's going to get speeded up uh, of uh, making where you will sell. Explain that a little bit. And that is itself evidence that globalization is alive and well, because, for example, the Trump administration is actively trying to incentivize and cajole American businesses to pull back out of China to manufacture in the United States. And you know what they've all said, literally all of them. They've said, thanks, Mr. President, but we're still going to make in China. Now, China can unleash a pandemic on the planet Earth collapse the global economy and uh, have these you know, cataclysmically negative ripple effects on the world. And still corporate America is saying, we're still gonna make in China because you have to make where you sell. China is a large market. Apple will still, every iPhone that Apple will sell in China will be made in China. General Motors has opened new automobile plants in China. Tesla has opened up a big gigafactory and showrooms in China. China, uh, Intel, Qualcomm, the semiconductor manufacturers, all everything in China. They will not pull out of China. But will they also start to manufacture in India? You bet. Vietnam? Absolutely. Make where you sell, make for that market. And even if it was technologically possible to have robots in Texas make all the iPhones that Apple sells in any given year for the whole planet, they would not be able to do it simply because if you want to sell those in China, and if you want to sell them in India, because India is absolutely practicing the same thing, make in India, hashtag make in India. The whole campaign is Chinese style industrial policy in a number of ways. And I don't, I'm not criticizing it. Every country gets ahead through import substitution oh. and by demanding that foreign investors make where you sell. So even if you could make it super cheap, cheap energy, cheap robotic labor in America, it's not going to cross the Chinese border. So how are you going to make your global revenue? Western multinationals get 40 to 60% of their global revenue from outside the United States, outside of Europe. How are they going to get it? So you cannot sacrifice that make where you sell principle. And that's where the world is going, which is, again, globalization, right? It's in just in a different form. It is morphing and mutating all the time. It's a, it's a regional globalization, if you like. Um, uh, one of the other things you wrote about, which I thought was interesting, 
is that you said coronavirus is actually the lightning before the thunder. In a sense, we're now looking, whatever, 70 days, 90 days into people's lockdowns, into how countries have dealt uh, with the virus and with health infrastructure. Uh, do you feel, as even President Trump has said, um, that the cure has in fact become worse than the disease? Uh, in other words, that the economic aftermath of the coronavirus will actually be worse because we sort of have, um, I don't know, have we, have we overdone the reaction to COVID coronavirus? I mean, I wouldn't want to, you know, in the precautionary principle is probably the most important, not only rule of thumb, rule to live by, and certainly, uh, you know, important uh, corrective intellectually on anyone who wants to second guess, uh, you know, this idea that we should be locking down. Right. The precautionary principle is really you know, instrumental in pragmatic public policy. So and also the other critique I would make of the idea that the cure is, so, so to speak, worse than disease is this is embedded in complexity itself, which is the feedback loop. Because how could you say the cure is worse than disease if then by, um, you know, reopening again, you're killing even more people. You're only making the disease worse. So the cure then is making the disease worse. So, I mean, you can't logically make that argument, not that, not that you're making it, but those who do need to think twice about this. But this is obviously a very important point as it relates to the aftershocks. So, I mean, think about uh, the worldwide famine. You know, let, let's not forget this. You know, we will have, let's just say, best case scenario or even baseline scenario, 300,000, 400,000 people may have died directly as a result of the coronavirus, which is far less than the 75 million people who died in the Black Death of the 14th century. But it is a tragic, reprehensible, moral crime that we can get an iPhone or some mobile phone in the hands of billions of people all over the world. And right now there is famine. Right now, millions of people are going to die because of the secondary effects of this coronavirus. We will not attribute it to the virus. We'll just say we won't even, may not even bother. That's how reckless and careless in a way uh, and, and how heartless in some ways this so-called global society is. We'll ignore the fact that millions of people will have died as an indirect consequence of the pandemic because of famine and starvation. And that number then, if you really add it up, have we, you will, we, we should be asking ourselves, have we, are we really doing better than the world did um, in 1918 or in the 14, you know, in, in, in the 14th century, and I, I find the answer really uh, very saddening. No, you're you're right. That one of the things that we really don't talk about are the kind of choices we've had to make because of the coronavirus, and even the the, the mental choices in a sense that it's okay that so many people die, or mentally, where you've heard of stories in places like Italy that saw some of the worst death tolls of of older people being told, perhaps we can't keep ventilators for you. So in a sense, the whole ethics of the world seems to be being questioned right now. One of the ethical questions that I do want to ask you about, and you've written so much on artificial intelligence, your book with, uh, with your wife, Aisha, was about hybrid reality and the move from man to machine in a sense. Uh, but do you think that, especially given the kind of economic uh, consequences of the coronavirus, how jobs are just getting destroyed in any case, uh, that there needs to be a greater rethink about this artificial intelligence um, alternative. Uh, you know, the reason I asked this, and I'm sorry, this is a really long question, but the reason I'm asking you this is uh, a little while ago, I was on a conversation, one of these webinars that have become part of our world now um, uh, because of the lockdown. And somebody said there should actually be a robot tax that people should be stopped from developing artificial intelligence until we can stabilize the job market around the world somewhat. Do you think uh, we need to rethink somehow some of these ethical questions? Um, I think these are first and foremost public policy and you know social policy and economic policy kinds of questions uh, when it comes to simply the issue of whether or not we should be using technology to replace human labor in very menial, manual kinds of things that uh, that, that people should you know by right really want to have to do. So, for example, it's an ethical question that uh, if if you deploy robots like look let's take south let's take a real world example right now let's take korea and it's worth dwelling on this for just a minute uh hyundai is one of the largest car manufacturers in the world it's a korean company they had a triple whammy they imported car parts from wuhan 
So obviously that supply chain was disrupted. They had sick workers at their largest plant, which is in Ulsan, South Korea. And of course, there's a global demand shock. So they're not selling any cars anyway. Now, moving forward, Hyundai, and, and South Korea has the highest robot density in the world, right? The number of robots per 100,000 workers. Now, moving forward, there is no question that Hyundai is going to invest a lot more in robots to make its cars, right? Why rely on human labor? It's also going to use 3D printing to make those car parts so that it doesn't have to import them from China. So they're going to, people be, are going to be laid off in Wuhan, who are no longer making car parts for Hyundai. And there are going to be humans uh, laid off in uh, South Korea who are no longer going to go work at the Hyundai plant because robots are going to do the work. Now, how, why is this first and foremost an ethical issue? This is a policy issue. You're talking about a very wealthy country. South Korea is one of the richest countries in the world. All they have to do is invest in worker retraining, right? Again, it's not really an ethical thing. It's a let's achieve full employment. Let's maximize human capital. Let's train workers for the next set of jobs. Let's have them be creating Internet of Things sensors because we're going to sell those all over the world too. It's a simple matter of having pragmatic, you know, a utilitarian public policy. So actually, I did just make it an ethical issue by saying utilitarian. In fact, I was on a webinar with Peter Singer, the Australian philosopher, just uh, the other day. And he's the, you know, the sort of embodiment of utilitarian uh, uh, thought. However, the point is, it's just common sense. And if you look at countries that have the highest robot density, South Korea, Germany, uh, Japan, and others, they also invest the most in worker retraining. And they don't make a they don't make this a big ethical quandary. It's just common sense. If people are going to be laid off in one area, you train them for another one so that they continue to earn money, pay taxes, and be uh, you know sort of uh, members of society, functioning you know members of society. Uh, so that's what we need to do. The countries there's not a trade off. And I want to apply this to India for just a second because um, artificial intelligence, uh, chatbots, and so forth are wiping out the call center industry. I was on a call with some Australian executives. They say, yeah, our, our, uh, non-Australia kind of, you know, footprint was having lots of call center workers in Bangalore and in Manila. And then suddenly they couldn't go to work. So we're not going to rely on them moving forward. We're going to have AI do that job in the future. So is this an, uh, now, even the future has gone away in the sense. Exactly. Because, Absolutely. Yeah. Yes. So now what's going to happen to all of this? kind of uh, academic question. This is like right now, India 101 public policy, right? And even if ethics are part of the equation or not, the fact is this is an, an, an obligation, this is a necessity, something that has to be dealt with right now. Now, here's the truth of it. People will do what you pay them to do. And in India, and this is the same problem in other countries, it's just more acute in India, we don't pay teachers enough, do we? We don't pay healthcare workers enough, do we? But in any country in the world, all you have to do is pay for the things that are essential services that we value and should value more. And guess what? The market is going to start to supply and train for those jobs, right? You just need supply and demand logic, even absent ethics to understand what rich countries like America are failing to do and what poorer countries like India are failing to do, which is to pay people what they deserve for those things that are actually essential services. But do you think that applies really to the global south or to a country like India that has a 1.3 billion population, you know, 20% or upwards that could be under the poverty line by the time the coronavirus has had all its effects? Does India need more agricultural productivity? Yes. Can a lot of jobs be created there? Absolutely. More infrastructure? Yes. This is one thing that obviously has been uh, stepped up quite a lot in the last few years, even more. A generation worth of new infrastructure needs to be built. Again, healthcare workers, educators, deploying the latest technology, you know, 5G, broadband. All of this can create tens and millions of jobs in India over the coming 10 years and beyond. It's a question of, are we paying people what these uh, what is deserved for these essential functions? And the answer is no, we're not. And that's what we need to do. Now, you brought us to an interesting question about the future of work. So I, I do want to just push this a little bit. Uh, the uh, big article in The Economist about how the office is dead. So it's not just about retraining people for jobs, but retraining how they will do the same jobs. Uh, um, so apart from that basic question of, are we for the rest of our lives going to wear nice tops and then 
floppy bottoms. Um, uh, uh, apart How did you know? That, Are you accusing me of something? I know at the end of, <laughs> at the end of every one of these sessions, it's like everyone should be made to stand up. Um, but uh, but be careful what you ask for, so. <laughs> But how do, you, how do you really see the future of the workspace changing? You know, because with it comes that worry that companies are going to say, I don't really need to pay for infrastructure. I don't really need to pay for healthcare. I don't need to pay for people to be there for anything more than the contract and the job at hand. Not necessarily true, because in civilized societies, which is to say basically uh, Western Europe and a couple of other pockets of the world, uh, but very few, unfortunately, you have uh, these obligations, obviously, where corporate taxes are high and uh, where there's mandatory, uh, you know, sort of there, there's uh, obviously state uh, funded health care and so forth. So there isn't a trade off between having a job and having health care the way it is in, in America. So uh, I would say that that's a limited you know, sort of, sort of dilemma. But, but that said, let's let's take this point because you have a lot of firms that are saying that they're definitely not going to go back to rehiring. Um, you know, the sort of having that high capex or, or opex and having you know lots of people, you know, full time staff and overhead and so forth. So instead, what they want to have is more part time remote teams that they'll assemble as needed. And this is bad news actually for the uh, software developers in rich countries. Because let's say you're an American company in Silicon Valley, you don't want to have, um, you know, uh, 500 software developers making $100,000 each that live in America. Why don't you just get Indians, right? Pay them $35,000 or something like that. And only as you need it. Um, and that kind of thing is going to happen. So actually, the technological disruption of the future of the workplace that has been underway, obviously, in a very rapid uh, sense in the um, in developed countries that are services-based economies, those workers are actually going to be hit even harder. And this could benefit India if it plays it to its advantage, interestingly enough. So again, by the way, that's more globalization. Digital globalization is taking off right now. Um, the Economist had a great uh, story. It said the internet is bursting at the seams. Right. Uh, so, you know, the more we have that deployment, the more seamlessly, uh, you know, computer scientists yeah. in India can continue to work for the top global companies. And of course, there is the, you know, that that phrase that we used to hear in the 80s and the 90s, uh, which is the digital divide, which is going to really decide one nation's progress uh, from another, how many of its people are digitally uh, enabled. Let's turn to some of the big world world uh, issues and do some crystal ball gazing. Um, to start with, Parag, you're one of the few people, you know, everybody's written about how they think that the world is going to change, and I, I know you wrote about that, uh, but you also wrote about the things in the world that are not going to change. So what are the big trends uh, where you think things in the world will stay the same? Well, I think, you know, going back to the, to the first uh, segment where we were talking about some of these areas of continuity, I was talking about, you know, regionalism and so forth. I want to, you know, sort of double down on a, another one of those points, which is that the, there was this anti-China sentiment that was really rising because of Belt and Road, you know, uh, debt trap diplomacy and so forth. And what I find so curious, and that's a euphemism for pathetic, uh, about what's been happening on Twitter to a large degree, especially in Western countries, is that there was this narrative, this meme, let's just say, that surfaced a few weeks ago where China's mask diplomacy um, and a few of its suave, you know, English language tweeting diplomats were, uh, you know, potentially turning the tide and convincing the world that, uh, you know, China has been a force for good and has been able to combat the virus and stands united with the rest of humanity. And people out in, people who just don't get out enough and Obviously, that's no longer just a figure of speech, I suppose, since you can't get out. But people who should have taken the last 10 years to spend some time in Asia and haven't, have been, you know, actually bought into that. And my retort to that was always, you know, if you think about the fact that the majority of the human population lives in Asia and no is much more familiar with China, we have China as a neighbor or very close to a neighbor, none of us are under any illusions as to where this virus came from and the nature of the Chinese Communist Party. So the suspicion of China that was already this high is now way off the screen, right? Mm -hmm. um, and it's going to stay that way, so I'll for the next thousand years, right? That's it. 
uh, and China itself has conceded this. We know from the leaked report um, from the uh, think tank called Kicker to the Ministry of State Security, mm -hmm. saying that they fear that this anti-Chinese backlash is uh, a genie that will never get put back in the bottle. I would have told you that three years ago. Let's be absolutely clear, right? A pandemic is just the icing on the cake. And uh, this means, and again, in terms of directly to your question, what is not going to change? It, Eurasia has been gravitating towards its natural state of affairs, which is actually multipolarity, not, you, not hegemony, not Chinese dominance, not China is number one, rather India rising, Japan reasserting itself, Europe uh, you know, taking various means and precautions to guard itself against excessive Chinese intrusion, Central Asian countries doing the same, and these coalitions building, like the Quad countries, the Indo-Pacific countries, saying, hey, we have to be careful to limit China's expansionism. And this is this natural geopolitical process. And a lot of people wrongly believed all along that somehow just because China is getting more powerful, it's on this linear pathway to dominance. But the feedback loop has been uh, quite profound, and that is going to be uh, even stronger moving forward. I think it's a very healthy thing. But you still believe that the future is Asian? I mean, the present is Asian. It's hard to imagine the future not being. Look, the world is tripolar, uh, from a, certainly from an economic standpoint. And since power ultimately resides in economics, it's fair to, uh, to make this conclusion quite robust. There's a, again, there's a North American system, there's a European system, and there's an Asian system. The Asian system has about 10 times more people than any of the other systems, right? It has 50% of global GDP. And coming out of this pandemic, it's the only economic zone that's actually growing. So Asia being itself already means the world is Asian because Asia is much of the world, right? Most literally more than 50% of the world is Asian. So Asia just has to be Asia without all the people leaving for Asia to be the future, in a, in a literal sense, leaving aside all of the global influence that Asia has. So it's, it's never really in doubt. Right, quite frankly, it's not it's not a debate as far as I'm concerned. It's a, maybe it's a debate of what people mean by Asia and that that's a valid conversation. And my contention has been that we have held Asia to be synonymous with China for far too long. Not we, that's not a mistake you or I would make, but it's certainly a mistake that's in the sort of general academic or intellectual discourse. And my goal has been to, you know, kick that to the curb. Sure, and uh, you know, just to counter or uh, attempt to uh, to challenge some of it, you know, in the last few weeks, we've seen uh, the U.S. really come out in in a in a strong way against China. At least the top leadership uh, has made it clear that they see China as the number one threat now in the world. Um, and uh, and we saw uh, the U.S. even try to take on the WHO, for example. So if I were to flip the question and say, despite the fact that the U.S. has taken on China, despite the fact uh, that the U.S. Uh, took on the WHO um, and, and said that the WHO was actually, I mean, the U.S. almost admitted that an organization like the World Health Organization was actually playing second fiddle, not to America, that pays so much of its funding, but to another power, to China. You look at the G7, for example, they couldn't come out with a, uh, with a, a statement a common statement because many of the countries disagreed with the statement criticizing China. The G20 totally stayed away from, uh, you know, the one led by uh, by uh, the Saudi king, totally stayed away from any criticism of China, the United Nations as well. So if I were to flip that and say, uh, certainly the US-China rivalry is something that seems to be here to stay as a trend, but do you see a shift in the balance of power? Well, again, you know, the, the way you're positing the question, it's that it's as if the winner of the U.S.-China rivalry dominates the world. The way I see it is that the U.S.-China rivalry is a subset of a much broader set of geopolitical alignments, right, in which, again, Europe still matters, Russia still matters, and so forth. Whatever happens in the G2 dynamic, it's part of a, a broader diffusion of power. The rise of China itself is evidence of the diffusion of power. The fact that Europe refuses to choose America over China or vice versa and say, hey, we are going to stand up for ourselves. We're going to support our strategic industries. We're going to protect our economy. We have our own um, you know, vision for the future and our own uh, regulatory approach to global influence. That's yet more evidence of a multipolar world. The fact that India 
absolutely refuses uh, to to back down, whether it's in um, the uh, in the uh, Doklam Plateau or whether it's in the Indo Pacific. The fact that it will you know uh, agree and part cooperate with uh, the U.S. on some defense issues, but still wants to push uh, you know an expanded trade with China and reducing its trade deficit. India is not going to simply play second fiddle either. So we are in a multipolar world. That's exactly my argument, that multipolarity sure. is healthy. So within that, you have US-China tensions. And just another point on global governance. I want to be really clear about this because it was a previous book and, and, uh, and I've dedicated a lot of time to it. The G7 doesn't matter. <laughs> the G20 doesn't matter. These are these organizations are they're not even by the way, they're not even organizations. They're informal, non-legal discussion clubs. They are group therapy for leaders whose shelf life is 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 quite ephemeral and deservedly so. So I, I don't put much stock in their so declaration. You, you're basically saying the the old war, world order, the post World War II order no longer exists. I'm not saying it doesn't exist. I mean, the United Nations and the Bretton Woods bodies collectively represent 250 individual multilateral organizations. Some of them are of greater relevance than others. The International Monetary Fund is extraordinarily important right now. In a way, it was receding in influence up until this pandemic because it had not one single significant program in Asia other than, than Pakistan. But even that, even that lending support was a fraction of what, for example, Argentina gets, right? So the IMF was all absent, actually, in the largest region of the world until suddenly overnight, half the world's countries are looking for credit lines from the IMF. A trillion dollars has to be put together. And so the IMF is absolutely front and center. The World Bank, $200 billion, $200 billion of lending and pushing very hard for debt relief uh, for many of the poorest countries in the world. So the Bretton Woods bodies are back. But the UN Security Council, come on, who the hell cares what comes out of the UN Security Council? I mean, India for for you know decades wanted a seat on the UN Security Council. That was not time. Still does. That, that that is not time well spent. That is not time well spent. That that that's an interesting thought for so many who see that uh, essentially as a uh, world power. Uh, I do want to ask you, um, you know, what you see as the future of another global tussle, which is of democracies versus authoritarian states. Uh, now, I want to say um, you have been accused of being anti-democratic, that uh, when you spoke about technique uh, cities, in a sense, uh, you were essentially extolling the virtues, not just of Singapore, where you live, um, but also places like Abu Dhabi and Moscow and, and uh, Kuala Lumpur, which don't necessarily uh, represent the, the, the most vibrant democracies themselves are going to be in strain in this post-pandemic world. Mm -hmm. I know there are a lot of caricatures out there about the notion of a debate between democracy and authoritarianism. It's largely, quite frankly, a dichotomy perpetuated by a small group of, um, you know, American or British, uh, you know, political scientists and journalists who just view the world in these black and white terms, the people who are looking for a new Cold War to replace the last one. And these are basically just graying figures who don't really understand much about you know, the evolution of political science, quite frankly, in the last 25 years because in political science we don't really talk about these false divides we talk about governance right? and and, and uh, how democratic a state is is a subset of the broader issue of how it's governed and how well it's governed the degree of stateness as and this is actually you know predates some of these debates is more important fundamentally than how democratic you are you can be a democratic state that is ineffective in delivering welfare to its citizens many african countries are like that how is that something to celebrate so the, i don't actually live in this sort of silly false divides i write about technocracy and the best and i devoted an entire book to this a couple of years ago the best technocracies in the world which is to say the countries with the best civil services, the most independent uh, institutions, the most capable bureaucrats who are well resourced to, to go out and deliver welfare to citizens are democratic countries. And that is on full display in this pandemic uh, situation. Japan, South Korea, Taiwan, Hong Kong, Singapore, Germany, Switzerland, world-class democracies, world-class. And the reason that they've been successful against the pandemic is not because they're democracies. I celebrate the fact that they're democracies. I've written, again, an entire book about it. So I'm not an apologist for authoritarianism. I'm celebrating the technocracy. The technocracy is that unheralded, 
underappreciated, uh, you know, stoic set of bureaucrats and, and institutions that get things done, right? And that's the part that we've ignored today. It's the civil service. So that's what a good technocracy is. And the best democracies in the world are also the best technocracies. It is not a false divide. Authoritarianism, I don't have patience for, right? And, uh, you know, I've spent legions, reams of pages on how Turkey and Russia uh, are basically just wolves in sheep's clothing. They are not to be confused with techn technocracies. They love to call themselves that. And they also do people into calling them that right but when i go to a country like that and i those are exactly the countries i go to all the time i look for the independent institutions i look for the professional uh, you know management of bureaucracies i look for the long-term sort of you know vision for implementing good public policy i don't see that in turkey I don't see that in Brazil. I don't see that in Egypt. I don't see that in Saudi Arabia. So I have zero patience for countries like that. And that's entirely what my record of you know writing is filled with. Sure. And on this uh, entire spectrum, where do you rate India today? Improving. And by the way, I, it's, it, it, in my opinion on this matters zero. And I have a table in um, in the book, in the Asia book, in the back, it takes the worldwide governance indicators of the World Bank, a Western institution, Western PhDs, Western academics crafting those indicators, and the uh, Economist Freedom House um, uh, ranking of democracy and freedom, uh, and inclusiveness also of the of the of the political system. And all you have to do is look at that table because it doesn't come from me. It's so, you know years, decades of research that's gone into producing these these rankings. And all and look at the rankings of Asian countries. They have almost entirely, almost all of them, have improved in their rankings of effectiveness of governance and in their inclusiveness as well. So I leave it with that. India has improved tremendously. It's in, uh, across the board in many of these indicators, deservedly so. Still has a long way to go, of course, but it is improving, improving in, in effectiveness, improving in inclusiveness. And that's, those are the, I, I, I applaud the work that's gone into those indicators. I don't believe that this is an East-West ideological divide. It's again, not a democratic authoritarian divide. It's quality of governance. And it's the, what every government should strive for. And, and you've made the case often that people are going to post pandemic um vote with their feet and move yes. away from countries that have not succeeded. Um, I can see a lot of questions out there, Parag, so I'm going to get to them. Before uh, that, I do want to ask you about the book you are writing right now, um, because I know you have all this time, particularly during the <laughs> lockdown. Uh, but tell us More than usual. Uh, it's exactly on the last point you were making, this voting with your feet. And it's so funny. I finished the book in January, uh, you know, so prior to uh, the pandemic. But everything that's been happening is, you know, reinforcing the arguments, which is that, you know, it's basically about the future of human geography. So where will the if we have nine billion people in the year 2040? where will they be? I've got this big map behind me. So it's, you know, I'm obsessed with just geography and all its forms. Where will people live? Why? How did they get there? Where did they decide to go? Right? All of these kind of big questions about the distribution of the 9 billion people of the future. And so it's all about voting with the feet. And again, this lockdown is so fascinating because we have never before had this complete and total standstill in international migration as we have today. But one day, those borders will open, we'll have a vaccine, we'll have immunological, we'll have immunity passports, countries will recognize the labor shortages they have, places that are red zones that have horrible health care are going to see citizens want to flee, uh, places that have, are, have uh, good health care uh, and are climate resilient are going to see a huge demand to come in. So we'll have this resorting of the world population. And that's what I'm kind of tracking in real time. And that's what the book is about. All right, let's take some of these questions and try and get through them because there are quite a few of them. Deepak Saxena asks, uh, put a timeline on just how much it is going to take uh, to reestablish economies and, and have economies recover post-pandemic. Look, you know, as you know, there isn't a credible answer to that, but there's a framework for thinking about it, right? So, you know, how open is your economy? How dependent are you on uh, trade and goods? And, uh, you know, how services driven is your economy? How self-sustaining is it just through local economic activity as people can move around again? How dependent are you on travel and tourism, right? Uh, these are the, how dependent are you on commodities exports? These are the questions you ask 
in order to know the timeline for an economic uh, recovery. There is no global answer to that question, not even close. Some parts of the world are going to be in recession uh, for a very, very long time. Other places will not go into recession at all. Sure. Uh, Abu Tariq, uh, the same question puts it uh, about India, says India is struggling with its economy. Uh, estimates, you know, that it's going to drop four to six percent uh, in its GDP. Uh, can it lead the world while it struggles with its economy? Well, no one leads the world right now, so that's a very tall order. But just what can India do for it for itself? Let's set our horizon narrow. Uh, you know what what India needs to do. I mean, let's just remember that uh, we should never waste a crisis, right? If you look at the '98 financial crisis, the 2008 global financial crisis, Asian countries learned various lessons along the way. Uh, you know, in the case of India, you can go back to 1990 and look at the various episodes that have spurred reform. So some of the things that obviously uh, have to be done better are, uh, or some of them were underway. You know, the banking uh, sector reform, uh, 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 having you know clear uh, uh, foreign investment laws, maybe some privatization, so floating assets. What, what a lot of countries are facing right now is obviously a widening fiscal deficit. And you don't want to let your fiscal deficit expand too far because it will affect your sovereign credit rating. Uh, so what countries do is they say, wait a minute, we need to bring in, you know, increased capital inflows, right? And so all of those assets, those companies, those big lumbering things, you know, Air India, whatever the case may be, oil, obviously oil and gas in a big way, these companies have been underperforming. Uh, you know, they're not well managed. Uh, let's bring in foreign capital and help to clean them up, right? So every country in Asia, not least India, is a very long list of assets that it needs to privatize for their own sake and for the country's sake. And what what we'll start to see is an acceleration of that very pragmatic process. So there's a lot of things. You know, in, in, you know what I like that's happening right now in your in your following the Indian conversation is uh, capitalizing on the anti-China sentiment the success of luring companies to invest in India and to get supply chains to shift towards India and recognition that some of these reforms need to accelerate because of the current account deficit and the weaker currency being attractive to investors. So I know that there are strategic conversations going on right now in New Delhi, where you are, where people are saying, let's get all of these stars aligned right now. Sure. Because well, we can- turn not this now, yeah. As you said, if not during the crisis, then uh, when so Mudit Jain has a question about China itself and says, at what point is there going to be a civil war inside China, uh, given the kind of restrictions there? <laughs> Only Indians ask that question. It's kind of hilarious, <laughs> and uh, uh, or or Americans. Um, look. Uh, I go to China a lot, you know, uh, I've been going to China very regularly for almost 20 years. Uh, there's not going to be a civil war in China is the short answer to the question, uh, you know, and, and uh, it's the kind of thing that for, for a very long time, you know, every I used to say every problem in China is the biggest problem in human history because it had the largest population. Soon we'll be saying every problem in India is the largest problem in human history, given the demographics. But sticking to uh, to China, look, you know, people have said, There'll be civil war because you have an aging population and you don't have a welfare state. Well, that's not true because old people don't go and storm the barracks, right? Uh, so, so again, and they have they're content in a way with their multi generational kind of kinds of systems and, and so forth. Every problem you can throw at China is a problem that they have heard of before, long before we accuse them of not dealing with it. And generally speaking, they have a plan. You know, uh, it's not a humane, not usually a humane plan. They, they, they break a lot of eggs to make their omelet, let's say. Um, but uh, I, don't, I still don't see the kind of structural weakness that would lead to implosion. I'll tell you one thing. Uh, no Chinese person I've ever met, no matter how much they fear and resent their government, wants any such scenario to pass. And therefore, it won't. All right. Um, uh, we have time for just one or two more questions. Murli asks, uh, technocracy oddly correlates with a higher education in the population. So is it just a chicken and egg situation? Oh, it's a good one. Uh, you know, not necessarily because it's, it's, by the way, it's a great question. I've never been asked that, uh, but it's an extremely intelligent point. So if we were to, you know, run some regressions on this, what we'd find is that there are, there are outliers. That's one thing. There are poor countries that, uh, that, that because they are poor, the margin for error is very low. So they try very hard to sort of, you know, bootstrap uh, and to perform well 
despite their, uh, you know, take a Costa Rica, for example, right? You know, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a seminal one, a very simple one, obviously, but again, a country that's not very wealthy, uh, but but they, they don't allow themselves to, to sort of screw up because they can't afford to. And there's other, you know, smaller, uh, poorer countries in that regard. Generally speaking, you know, what happens is that countries go suffer a certain crisis, a pandemic may be one, it could be uh, suffering a loss in a, in a war or a financial crisis. And that is this wake up call, this sobriety check, where you realize that suddenly, you know, you run the risk of disintegrating as a state, and you really have to uh, bootstrap and become more technocratic. You can't just suffer a generation after generation of corruption. I Let me give an example that everyone uh, understands, Ukraine. Right. Ukraine was just, you know, spinning around the spin cycle of constant corruption, recycling its leaders aimlessly going about. And then one day Russia invades. And suddenly it's not so funny anymore, is it? Right. To be a tin pot state that just is goofily yeah. bumbling along. And, you know, sure, NATO loves you because you're quasi democratic and, you know, you're needed as a buffer against Russia. Suddenly inside Kiev, things get really serious because you've been bloody invaded. Right. A chunk of your territory has been taken away from you. Now, they don't really have brilliant leaders right now. But I'll tell you one thing. They're not really allowed to get away with the perpetual stupidity and, and malfeasance mm -hmm. and political malpractice. That was the order of the day in all of my visits to Ukraine uh, during the 2000s. You can't do that anymore. So that's an example. So sometimes countries have to suffer in order to learn. And by the way, I'll, let me be absolutely clear that this is where Francis Fukuyama ends his uh, recent two volume uh, book, Political Order and Political Decay about the United States. He says, short of an alien invasion, he doesn't really know what will compel the United States to wake up and realize that you don't just automatically have this God-given ability to renew yourself as a civilization uh, based on the existing stock of virtues that you have, right? Right now, it could take a revolution in order for people to wake up and realize that enough is enough at some level. And that's part of why we're all glued to what's happening in the U.S. right now, because it isn't clear. Uh, that this renewal that has characterized America generation after generation, it's just not clear that that's going to happen this time. Yeah, well, I mean, you ruffled enough feathers more than a decade ago when you said wave goodbye to hegemony for uh, for the U.S. Um, final question, and I know we have to let you go after this. Um, how do you feel about the comparisons made to a century ago? In other words, there was the Spanish flu, um, there was economic problems, and then there was the world war and then came the big depression and then we had famines. Do you see a parallel? Do you see a big world war following this kind of pandemic? It's not inevitable. I suppose it would, you know, satisfy in a, in a very obviously schadenfreude kind of way, historians who like to see the, the rhyming of history, but I don't view it as inevitable or inexorable. I think it's a very stretched analogy in any case, you know, are some, some of those conditions in place? Yes, but not due to any kind of causal mechanism per se. You know, we have the ability through the reflexivity principle to stop and say, wait, why would we go down this path when we can just as soon not go down this path? And this is why populist governments in Europe were failing before the pandemic because populist policies are horrible. Now, I've never met, I know you haven't met a populist leader with good economic policy. They more or less self-implode uh, by right and deservedly so. So do we have to go on this path? No. And, I, and here's another thing, and, and I hope you side with me on this. I despise European analogies for global history, right? We are not in a European world anymore. I spent yeah, well, uh, sure. you know, chapter four of the Asian book saying, give me one lesson from European history that applies to Asia today. Asians don't have rigid alliances and these automatic chain reactions that lead to escalations in world war. That's not how Asians think. That's not how Asian strategy even works. So why are we pretending that 1914 uh, explains what will happen in Asia in the 21st century? You know, in th for the last 30 years in Asia, since the collapse of the Soviet Union, governments have been very pragmatic. There are plenty of reasons or potential triggers of conflict between India and China, Taiwan, South China Sea, Senkaku Islands. And yet each time leaders say, hold on, it's not worth it, right? Now, that doesn't mean that they're going to you know, maintain that pragmatism. Nationalism could spill over, but it hasn't yet. And I think we should focus more on what the lessons of Asian history hold for Asia's future than making these kind of, you know, more or less nonsensical uh, analogies to European history. 
All right, Parag, I'm going to have to leave it there, but what a pleasure it's been. You've been sobering, but you've also left <laughs> a lot of space for hope post-pandemic. We certainly look forward to your next book as well. And if we were not in this environment, I'd ask everyone uh, for a round of applause for you. I'm going to hand it back to the team at Thank JLF. Thank you so much. It was a great Thank conversation. You. Thank you. Thank you so much, Parag. Thank you so much, Suhasini Haider. And absolutely, it's not necessarily Europe's way anymore. It is the time of Asia, and hopefully uh, we won't see a world war again. Uh, thank you both so much. I'm, I'm sorry we couldn't take all the questions, and they were really pouring in, and you could see uh, uh, Suhasini trying to restrain herself from asking all the questions she had, and we do apologize, and if we can, we will send these questions out to uh, Parag, if you may, and sure. we get, uh, get back to you with some of these answers. But thank you for being such a great audience. Uh, thank you, uh, Suhasini, and for Parag for, for taking the time out today uh, for that really deeply analytical and uh, introspective conversation. We thank our radio partner, Red FM Bajati Raho, and please do remember to tune in at 9 p.m. for our next session, Erebus, Michael Palin in conversation with William Dalrymple, driven by a passion for travel and history and a love of ships and the sea former Monty Python stalwart and a BAFTA award-winning performer for his role in that iconic film, A Fish Called Wanda. Globetrotter Michael Palin explores the world of HMS Erebus, last seen on an ill-fated voyage to chart the Northwest Passage. In conversation with William Dalrymple, Palin brings the fascinating story of the Erebus and its occupants to life, from its construction as a bomb vessel in 1826 through the flagship years of James Clark Ross's Antarctic expedition, and finally to Sir John Franklin's quest for the Holy Grail of navigation, a route through the Northwest Passage, where the ship disappeared into the depths of the sea for more than 150 years. It was rediscovered under the Arctic waters in 2014. Meanwhile, for those of you who are willing to stay logged on, we have a special extract from the Jeffrey Music Stage archives. Creator of the Mohan Veena, Grammy Award winner, musician who was awarded the Padma Shri and Padma Bhushan, and recipient of numerous musical awards and honors, Pandit Vishwa Mohan Bhatt hails from a family that has a 300 year old lineage. A disciple of Pandit Ravi Shankar, he Indianized the Western Hawaiian guitar and christened it as the Mohan Veena. We play an extract from his performance at the Jaipur Music Stage. Remember to log back on at nine o'clock. Thank you.
Thank <laughs> you.